Today's webinar is State of the Skills Gap 2023, Challenges and Opportunities in Supporting a Post-Pandemic Workforce. Our webinar today is held in partnership with Wiley University Services. So thank you to Wiley for helping us put this on. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Senior Director of Membership and Programs here at WCET. The slides are available in the chat. And as we go through today, feel free to engage in the chat conversation. And as you have questions, put them into the Q&A so that we can make sure that we don't lose those amongst the chatter and we'll get to your questions during the Q&A. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion and you can follow along at hashtag WCET webcast. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off to today's moderator. Please welcome Suzanne Ehrlich, who's the Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Unite Design Lab at the University of North Florida and is also on our steering committee. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you, Megan, I appreciate it. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. We're excited for this conversation we're gonna have today. And I'm thrilled to introduce a, an incredible panel um, that's been put together for today, including uh, Dennis Bonilla, Dean at Wiley Edge Global Academy. Thank you. David Caprinos, who is Director of Market Strategy and Research at Wiley University Services. Thank you, David. Elizabeth Creamer, who is Vice President of Workforce Development, Community College Workforce Alliance. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Matt Seemers, Interim Provost at Eastern Oregon University. All right, we're gonna get ready and uh, start this conversation and starting with you, David, thank you for taking the time to present this information. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. Um, so uh, today we're gonna be focused on, on a, a phrase that we hear a lot in the news today. Uh, it's this idea of a skills gap. And essentially we're trying to define it as uh, this disparity, this sort of uh, gap between uh, what organizations need to deliver on um, their goals versus what's available in the current workforce, right? And so I think as educators, uh, as people that think about, uh, you know, um, skilling and reskilling and upskilling and things along those lines, obviously the skills gap is a big part of what's going to drive um, our thinking is how do we how do we uh, attack this? So we did a study. We can go to the next slide here um, that uh, you can download. I think we're, we're we've got a link to it probably in the chat here. But it's a report called uh, the Skills Gap Report: Reimagining the Workforce. And what we did is we surveyed um, over 600 human resource professionals. So it was at, at all levels. Uh, some of these folks were C level executives, you know, chief talent officers, things along those lines. We also had uh, kind of senior level folks, uh, HR representatives. Uh, we surveyed all across different sizes of organizations too. So we had some really small organizations up to, you know, some of the bigger companies in America and across a number of different um, industries or domains too, right? So we had a lot of manufacturing, retail, technology, and even healthcare in there. And we asked them a battery of questions around um, the skills challenges, especially in this post-pandemic uh, environment. So we go to the next slide there. Um, we're going to share with you some of our key findings, uh, and the the plan today is for me to share a few data points related to those key findings, and then we'll have a lively discussion uh, with some of the colleagues that we have on the phone here, hopefully. So uh, key areas that we're going to talk about is how the skills gap has spread, um, how there are uh, staffing challenges, that there's sort of a vicious circle that we'll talk about related to skills gaps. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the alternative credential market um, and how some companies and corporations are thinking about those things outside of the degree. Uh, we'll then get into um, some recommendations throughout too and uh, try to save some room for you folks to ask some questions as well. So without, with that uh, being said, let's get into the key findings here. So our key finding, the first one was um, around uh, the skills gap just broadening, right? So unsurprisingly, if we go to the data here, um, we were actually able to um, survey folks a couple years ago around this theme. Uh, and we asked a pretty simple question, you know, do you believe there's a skills gap in your organization right now, right? So are you, are, do you have this mismatch uh, that we talked about earlier? And you can see from the data about half the folks in 2021 said, sure, I think, I, you know, we definitely have one, maybe about a third questioning the idea, maybe we do, maybe don't, you know, we need to evaluate. Post-pandemic and in this recent, you know, survey that we did, now it's two-thirds of folks are, yes, absolutely, we have a skills gap, we have a challenge. Um, in, in having the skills in the organization that we need to be able to deliver on our goals. Uh, a, a lot less um, folks are a lot less unsure too, right? So that number getting cut in half to about 14% there. Um, folks understand that there's an issue right now in our economy. And the issue is, is that the skills that I need maybe aren't necessarily in the population. So let's go to the next slide here. Um, 
so we ask a follow-up question. We say, hey, if you do have this skills gap, um, what are you doing about it, right? And, and again, these are the, the talent folks in an organization, people responsible for hiring, people responsible for, for kind of growing the business. Um, a lot of them said to us, as much as two-thirds said to us, we're looking at upskilling and reskilling our current employees. So we're investing in ourselves first. We're going to try to, um, you know, offer those laddering opportunities, whether it be tuition reimbursement, um, kind of on-the-job training type stuff, enrichment training, uh, certificates, things along those lines. A good portion of them are saying that um, we're going to hire these skills in or we're going to outsource them out, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of different strategies there, but I think a lot of it, uh, you know, at its foundation is around education and having some opportunity for uh, you as educators to inter interface with these people, interact with these people to, to help bring those skills uh, into their organizations. So um, I'm going to go through to the next uh, finding too, and then I think we'll open it up for conversation after this. But the other finding we have was that when a skills gap forms, staffing challenges follow. And this was an interesting one for me. It seems like kind of that classic like snake eating its tail graphic, right? We asked folks, um, you know, what are the causes of your skills gaps or what are the causes of your recruitment challenges? And a lot of them are saying it's like, hey, we, we've got this existing gap and that kind of makes us seem out of date or out of touch or, you know, maybe we're, we're losing share to other companies out there, things along those lines. And that's driving, um, you know, this vicious circle where we're going to get even more recruitment challenges. It's going to be harder for us to, to acquire these, um, these skills from the marketplace. So, Again, a, a, a what are you doing about it type question to these organizations. And it's interesting to see that a lot of them will easily identify it as like, um, we don't have the, the development initiatives in-house, right? We're, we're, we don't have these resources. We don't have off-the-shelf training and development services. Um, you know, essentially, we're, we're probably going to need to spend some money. We're going to have to spend some time. We're going to have to find resourcing. We're going to have to do that outside of the organization and bring it in. And again, I think, you know, um, the membership of, on this call, this is your opportunity, right? You know, the companies are looking for uh, ways to do this. They're looking for ways to do it efficiently. And I think there's an opportunity here to find more connections with employers and, and help them upskill and reskill their workforces. Suzanne, did Yes, absolutely. So this is a great point for us to, I already have a number of thoughts that it sparked within me listening sure. to the findings here, but I think it's a great opportunity to um, reach out to Dennis and maybe get some insight from uh, maybe your perspective, from the industry perspective and how um, companies might be struggling to fill some of these positions or how some of these findings might relate. Well, yeah, I couldn't agree more with the findings. We're seeing that, you know, for our clients who are primarily in the financial services, high, um, high tech demand, high technical environments, you know, they're finding that during the pandemic, certainly a lot of people sort of relocated or did a lot of quiet quitting. But now that they're they're coming back and they're asking people to, you know, sort of come back to the workplace, we're finding that the skills gap are getting even more severe. And, you know, they're breaking them down into really two categories. There's the technical skills gap, which obviously for our clients are focused on software development, data analytics, data visualization, even writing skills, believe it or not, are, are ones that technically people are just not doing, are not finding enough people who have that. But we're finding even more, they're also interested in trying to fill some of these softer skills gaps associated with communication skills, uh, visualization skills, uh, something as simple as uh, Excel or PowerPoint and how to visualize and communicate those. Uh, collaborate, collaborating, how do they collaborate in teams, especially in a hybrid work environment? And what are they doing in terms of, you know, cultural sensitivity? So it's a mix of both hard technical skills that are missing in the organization, combined with the soft skills that will make them successful. As the technology will evolve, these soft skills become more and more important in terms of critical thinking and problem solving. So it's, 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 it's there, they're experiencing it, and everybody is suffering from it. Thank you for that. Um, Matt, I would like to go to you to, to get your insights on how institutions uh, might be looking at curriculum and, um, you know, connecting with alums and, and so forth on these topics as well. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> here at Eastern Oregon University, the curriculum begins with the, with the deans and the faculty bo body at the college level. And then let's say it successfully moves out of the college, it goes to a, a place called EPCC, which is Educational Policy and Curriculum Committee. 
and their um, crucial conversations take place. And if there is any need for continuous improvement for updating the curriculum or aligning it, whether it's for an online model or face-to-face -face class or hybrid class at Eastern Oregon University, then it might go back to the college, get wordsmithed, updated, and then it's transitioned back to EPCC where the registrar and the group, you know, are part of a voting process. And then it moves to faculty senate. Faculty Senate gets to look at it closely and provide analysis or discussions, which oftentimes by the time it gets to Faculty Senate, it's kind of wash, rinse, repeat. It's already been cleansed and moving forward. And then it depends if it goes at the state level or part of our national accreditation. If it's a new program that's existing, the challenges could be new programs take a little bit longer to ferment at the state level, but everything else that's kind of thematically woven through the institution of higher education here at Eastern Oregon University, um, it usually has a really good nudge forward to move it out of the institution in the hands of the community or part of our partnerships with community colleges for common course numbering or what we have MTMs. Um, we actually have major transfer maps that are aligned so the curriculum starts to get its, its kind of hooks all over the state as well as um, coming backwards into the institution into the hands of the faculty member to disseminate in a classroom and expand from there. Thanks, Matt. Elizabeth, what about you? Um, I represent Community College Workforce Alliance as a shared workforce development division between two community colleges. Um, we had uh, we were different than most higher education in workforce development in the community colleges in that we had a real explosion of enrollment. Um, we specialize in credentials that are non-traditional. So certification, state-issued licenses, all of them tied to high demand occupational fields um, that are aligned with state and regional economic development um, research and labor market needs as validated by companies. So we're, we're all about these fairly short-term four to 15 week, um, you know, burst, instructional burst of um, both hard and soft skills. Um, but then um, we know that we want to really be the first step in a continuum of lifelong skills attainment. And we're convinced that the answer to doing that is in shorter burst of training. Rather, it's non-credit for workforce credentials or credit. Um, we're looking at associate degree programs now in terms of um, smaller bites. We're offering uh, many semesters between traditional academic semesters. Um, we're ensuring that there are pathways from non-credit workforce credentials that can then provide some college credits towards um, college certificates and associate degrees. <clears throat> we're making sure that associate degrees are um, aligned and articulated with university programs in career and technical education areas where that's feasible. And then finally, we're thinking, all right, even if someone follows that trajectory, and we certainly have case studies of students who fare very well with that, um, we're convinced that then they need to come back to us. So we keep up an aggressive to, you know, to earn more certifications, to keep current in both technical and soft skills proficiencies. So we keep up a robust communication campaign, social media, email blast, um, invitations back to um, micro learning sessions um, that are complimentary and the list goes on. We also have a robust state um, financial assistance program for all of this credentialing. Well, all of you have spoken to the currency aspect of this, and there's a great question um, about whether or not um, whether or not the skills gaps will have changed by that time and the time frame and responsiveness um, being challenging. Does anybody want to speak to that element here, the 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 challenging aspect of of responsiveness in a particular time frame? Matt or Elizabeth? Yeah, I can I can, I can talk on that. Um, it's in constant flux. But the good thing here at Eastern Oregon University, we actually have programs to kind of get it to what we call homeostasis, get it stabilized so that we can um, meet those timelines 
and do kind of a forward thinking approach. Kind of, we try, we, we have a joke here. We think like chess players, three steps ahead of the flux and the change, always think ahead of the process. So I'll put in the chat room when I talk about our micro credentials and credentialing process, our program, so you can look at them and steal. <laughs> but anyway, so we actually have measures in place to handle that change, especially around credit for prior learning and micro credentials. And so no matter the workforce is it's changing around us outside of our kind of unit, when it comes to us, then we can kind of meet that tech transfer into programs. So we can get them into what's called Reach the Peak or APEL. And our APEL program that we have is now kind of connected with Kale and their services, which is a national provider for credit for prior learning. And then we kind of dovetail that to um, um, dual, dual sponsored credit for high school. So we're, we're trying to create really an effective, efficient degree in three, not three years, three steps, high school, community college, us. And then we look at credit for prior learning and we kind of pull some of that credit out of the pathway and give them credit for that to bump them and nudge them forward a little bit faster. So as the flux consistently is in peaks and valleys with us, we're trying to get that measurement process for the student and the collaboration and the partnership to keep them streamlined and moving forward. We think we've got it with the on-campus. The next step is online. Great. I, think there's, I think there's like two streams here, right? And I think a lot of the time when we're thinking about um, skills gaps and skills, I think all of us are going right to programming languages, right? Or or working on the newest, hottest technology or, or things along those lines. But what, some of the gap that we're seeing too is on, on more human-centered skills like communication, critical thinking, some of these other things that are sort of evergreen for the institution. So I think there are like um, different opportunities, right? You know, um, I think about myself and business education, uh, you know, you learn some of those initial soft skills around leadership, but you're in your 20s and maybe you don't really have an opportunity to apply them, but then you come back uh, you know, in your 30s and 40s and 50s, it's like, wow, I really need to go back and get some more education and think about leadership, thinking about it. So now it's very different than it was in an earlier part of my career. Correct. Soft skills are important. Yeah, absolutely. In one of our programs, we actually do portfolio assessment of the soft skills and, you know, um, interviewing skills, skill sets, sure. <laughs> dress and, like fire, a and things like that, that oftentimes are overlooked, at, you know, or have been forgotten because they went to the workforce for a decade, half decade, and they're trying to enter into higher education or another place, mm -hmm. a transition process. Speaking of transition, this is a great segue to, to the oh, key finding well number three for <laughs> David. I think this is, you know, we've got great questions going on as well in the chat as a result of these conversations. Thank you for everybody. Yeah, so let's get into our third finding here uh, around alternative credentials. And I think we were sort of already bleeding into this a little bit, right? Thinking about um, educational opportunities maybe below the degree. Uh, and so we, we asked this really interesting stack of questions. This is something that we do as a survey researcher. Uh, you see this in like political polling and stuff too, where you ask someone, um, what did your bachelor's degree do for you? Was it important to your career goals? And a lot of people say, well, yeah, of course, you know, it got me where I am today. You know, 80% of people say it was really important to them. Um, but then you start asking further down, you say, um, well, what about for other people, you know, and what about in the future? And what, you know, um, do you think it's as valuable as it once was? And, and it sort of tarnishes a little bit, right? You get these lower and lower response rates. And so the truth is probably frankly, somewhere in the middle, right? You know, but, uh, you know, uh, but there is something out there where folks are saying, Hey, maybe maybe people aren't picking up the skills that I need from from bachelor's level education. I think we hear this attack all the time. So I think one of the things that's really important is probably um, in as much teaching folks the the skills they're going to learn in a program, but also how to talk about them, right? And I think career services, things along those lines, how to present what you learned well uh, in your professional uh, life. I think it equally ends up being important here. Let's go to our next uh, slide. Um, kind of a companion to this is one of the things that we asked uh, these HR professionals is. Uh, you know, the value of, of a degree, the value of certificates and badges and micro-credentials and some of these things. And so we, we ask them this in a couple different ways. But when you say, if someone has five years of work experience, um, which is what a lot of jobs require these days, sometimes it's hard to get that five years of work experience, right? Especially out of college. Um, but what we're seeing is, is that if someone has uh, maybe a certificate or maybe a badge or a credential, or they can show some sort of uh, formal learning uh, in these areas that there's almost an equivalency to some of this work experience. And so uh, this was interesting and I think important for some of our uh, new graduates to think about as they're thinking about their career. Lastly here, um, you know, this will probably be particularly relevant to, to Elizabeth too in the work that she does. We asked a battery of questions around, well, what about the other stuff, right? What about industry certification? What about 
boot camps, um, you know, project portfolios, badging, MOOCs, and some of these other kind of shorter engagements. And we really see that um, a, a big openness to accepting these as uh, alternatives or as, as you know, even preferential in some cases uh, to the degree, right? And so that's something that's concerning for me. You know, we, we do a lot of investing in, in uh, universities and university degrees and things along those lines. But it looks like um, from the employment side, especially in a really tight labor market, uh, they're they're interested in in you know finding some of these other credentials uh, as as near equivalents. Um, final thought here, just you know, kind of thinking through the the basic fundamental strategies. Obviously, there's a lot more to this, uh, but thinking about. Uh, what to bolt on to your portfolio, you know, what to kind of add in, uh, you know, the flow here is, is start with looking at, um, you know, th those opportunities, uh, you know, out there in the market, what are we seeing is in terms of gaps? What are we seeing out in the labor market? What are, what are employers looking for? Um, you know, thinking about uh, finding educational opportunities to help uh, students learn, earn these credentials, maybe with your degree, right? So thinking about, you um, you know, uh, maybe you sit for, maybe you get a project management degree, but then you also find a way to sit for the PMP certification with it, right? Uh, you know, uh, we do that with things like accounting and other degrees all the time, but I think there's a lot more opportunities for it. Uh, cybersecurity degree, how do you also sit for your CISSP exam and certification as part of your cybersecurity degree, those sorts of things. Um, and lastly here, uh, you know, trying to remove some of these barriers to things like prior learning credit, uh, some of the things that we were just talking about in that last round. Thank you. Uh, the discussion is lively both here and in the chat, so we're capturing as much as we can. I'd like to just remind everybody as well um, to enter those Q&A um, questions into the question answer option at the bottom or in the um, Zoom system would be wonderful as well. But I want to transition over to Matt as well to comment on this and your own, uh, from your own perspective, your own educational pathway and how institutions can better serve um, you know, we, we might call non-traditional pathways and perhaps other labels on students and how they, um, how those receiving those um, credits play out in maybe challenging ways through um, the higher ed landscape. So from my perspective, passion, because I entered the workforce after high school and was a welder and went to community college and took classes at night. And when I finally went into higher ed, as a student full time, they didn't accept any of my transfer courses. So I became, as a first gen learner, I became passionate about it. So when I came here to Eastern Oregon University as a dean and now in the provost role, um, I would describe institutions, they move like a pack of turtles through a sea of peanut butter. And then all awesome, which is we also have to move at the, the speed of trust. So you combine those two and it gets kind of messy. But we found kind of a gap that we can widen here for. Um, <clears throat> Shared governance is certification and micro-credentials and working with the non-traditional students and analyzing their workforce. So I shared in the, the link, um, our April program does that. We put a heavy analysis on their work background and soft skills and hard skills and all those skill sets. And we try to get them through the pathway of this institution in a way that they're just not taking courses and take courses. And so we wanna honor the fact that our certification pathways um, are respectfully appreciative of their, their workforce values and what they bring to the institution. Now, trying to find that happy medium is a challenge oftentimes, but we actually have, we actually have counselors that do that work for us. And so it makes it more of a streamlined opportunity. And we just brought in a $1.6 million grant. So we're gonna throw some rocket fuel on the concepts and ideas of getting this online. And so we are excited about this opportunity. But at the end of the day, we really just want to work with the non-traditional or traditional students and consistently find them successful pathways to leave the workforce, come to higher ed, go to the workforce or kind of make a hybrid model of that. But along the, the, along the way, they're getting certificates that actually have um, grit and they're building fidelity through this whole entire process that the certificate isn't just a paper on a wall. It's skill sets that they can utilize. And then what we want is we want to kind of put a little greed around that. So these companies want more and more and more of these employees to hire because they have the skill sets that they've acquired through our processes here at Eastern Oregon University. So it's a model that can be adopted for other institutions or businesses that we're continually gaining ground on for narrowing that gap. 
So it sounds like you're speaking even to the question that was posed by Susan Walcott, that maybe we can circle back after um, yeah. a few more key findings around how that effective, effective critical thinking can be embedded in all courses from a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to make note of the ongoing conversation around the phrase soft skills, <laughs> um, which I also find really incredible from effective to human centered from our evolving uh, landscape that we're talking about here. So it's very yeah. uh, relevant to our discussion. So thank you for that. Right. Um, and then we're gonna jump back to David again for our next key finding, key finding four. Yeah, I'll, I'll say it's funny. Uh, we had a lot of internal debate on on some of our survey questions, whether you say like, you know, what are you looking for? Softer, hard skills, that sort of thing, just because it's such a common term and a term that everybody uses. We really wanted to use one of these newer kind of more evolved terms, but we ended up saying like, oh, in, in clarity, we're going to use soft skill. But yeah, I I, I kind of loathe that term as well. Um, so the, the next section here uh, is about unlocking uh, opportunities, right, and removing barriers, things along those lines. So if we go to the next slide here, um, we've got some data around uh, you know, whether or not companies are partnering with schools to fill their skills gap, right? And I think this is a big thing, you know, big part of the conversation here. It was interesting for me to see that uh, fully half of these folks said, yes, we're, we're sort of actively engaged in this. Um, but then another quarter of them said, we've done it maybe in the last three years, maybe we've pulled back on it, right? And so I think a lot of companies are, you know, uh, have some austerity measures in the pandemic, right? And kind of pulled it back on uh, HR and training and development. Some of those things are some of the first things to go, I think often uh, when, when there's rough seas. Uh, but if you look here at a graphic like this, you know, simply saying 75% or so of the, of the, the organizations in your backyard are probably looking to partner with you. Right. How many partnerships do you actually have? Right. And so I think putting the investment in to have uh, dedicated folks that go and nurture these relationships, people that can get in there and actually, um, you know, listen, build, uh, react to some of these things is really critical um, to, the, to the opportunity here for you. Partnerships, I'm sure, will ignite a lot of conversation here. Sure. Well, well. Yeah. And I'm really um, interested in hearing from you, Elizabeth, on how. Um, what your approaches are to building those partnerships? Um, one fundamental, one fundamental change since the pandemic, and I, I don't think it's necessarily related to that, but community college workforce development now has a a really close partnership with the state's economic development agency, mm -hmm. um, and and we meet as a team. Um, with companies that are considering expanding or locating to Virginia. And that's really um, substantially informed and transformed the work that we're doing with um, micro-credentials, with certifications, with licenses, you know, with thinking in terms of skills and, and pathways and um, portfolios of um, credentials that have meaning in the marketplace. Um, we, for instance, we've got pharmaceutical manufacturers that are um, locating in the region that um, my division serves, and we have worked with them to develop a continuum of learning experience and credentials that start with high school, include bridge programs for adult learners who may be underskilled um, and, and need some kind of developmental work to access workforce or community college um, credential programs. We've got community college degrees now and um, workforce credentials. All of them are covered by another, um, another asset that's been developed through an important partnership and that's with our own General Assembly and a succession of governors who have um, aligned these high demand occupations emerging industries with um, the opportunity for scholarships and for tuition assistance um, to Virginians of um, all levels and um, in some parts full scholarships for those who are middle class or, or, or below in terms of income levels. So that's been a type of partnership. But beyond that, in order to, um, to get the talent that we're looking for in technician trades level jobs in information technology and healthcare and manufacturing and logistics um, and other techno technological fields. 
we've really had to expand our partnerships with community-based organizations. Uh, we are a majority minority um, center. Um, we're about 60% minority students. Um, we have a uh, about half of our students are on needs-based financial assistance. Um, and that's because we've been partnering with about 50 community-based organizations, um, really offering the clients and customers they serve an opportunity to get to living wage jobs. Um, and we can do that through these types of credentials and also, also through non-traditional um, routes to higher education credentials, such as registered apprenticeships, where the apprenticeship related instruction is done through the community colleges. Partnerships are absolutely the foundation of what we're trying to do mm -hmm. in driving these credentials as a way to um, prepare for the workforce. Um, more residents in our region um, and more underrepresented residents, um, those who have not normally been um, well represented in higher education and, and who need help, need different kinds of programming in order to access living wages. Sounds both very robust and, and um, like many of our conversations here, opportunity for expansion and growth. Um, Matt, uh, what about some of those partnerships that you've um, built or um, seen or observed in terms of this particular finding? Matt? You cut out. Could you repeat that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I was just asking about your partnerships as well. <laughs> well, our <laughs> partnerships. Um, <laughs> yes. No, it cut out. It said my internet's unstable. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> so we have a lot of partnerships and we partner K-12 in education in Oregon gets a lot of funding through what's called the Student Success Act, which is a billion dollars funded by through the biennium. And then they have Measure 98, which is like 300 million for um, work around uh, a workforce development at the high school level. So we we partner with a lot of uh, education service districts and we have a lot of good conversations about building that bridge between high school workforce to the institution or just high school workforce and involving, you know, any help that we can provide them. Um, a lot of listening goes on and a lot of appreciation for the work that they have in place and, um, finding ways to support them, even with our connections through the workforce, as well as um, collaborative opportunities. And so it's really nice to, to develop partnerships also with the community colleges, because the community colleges work really well with us. And um, so when I arrived here, I always said, I, I don't want a million dollars, I want a million friends. Well, be careful what you ask for when you get into the partnering world, because everybody wants to partner up with you before you know it. So you can only, you know, do so much windshield time. Uh, we do a lot of partnering with vocational schools and because um, Oregon is a big workforce state and they put a lot of money into students who want to go into the VOTEC pathway into the workforce. And so we actually have a program which is career and technical education. So you can actually be in the workforce and go through our program and then go back and be a teacher uh, at a high school to teach welding, to teach HVAC, to teach, you know, fire services. And it's, it's, a, it's only a 15 credit hour pathway where they get this specialization certification. So um, we do, I think we do a fair good job of, of the partnerships and, and the collaborative piece of working together. Well, I think it speaks to Rob Gibson's question here that when he talks about, and maybe something we can circle back also as we kind of move through these key findings on how that balance can be embedded from, you know, supporting a traditional preparation in an involving uh, labor market, you know, how do those other degrees, such as humanity degrees, still hold value in this particular climate? So we'll circle back to that question as well. And I pose that to the group here and pose those that question to, I see the conversation um, also in chat around these areas and how those partnerships can also help that as well. So David. Yeah, you kind of caught me looking at the uh, the chat here. <laughs> Just a lively a parallel good, conversation. Yeah, uh, it's a good yeah, chat. It was great. Um, so uh, one of the other kind of themes here that we were talking about was, um, you know, what I think there was a question in the chat too around like, how do you actually do this stuff, right? How do you work with employers um, to kind of uh, 
actually get things going. And I think coming to them with an idea of what you want to do and what you have available is probably the best place to start, right? So, um, you know, one of the things that we see a lot of uh, folks do is kind of leverage uh, existing tuition reimbursement platforms, right? And say like, hey, this is, I know Boeing is nearby for me and they do you know, full reimbursement or they reimburse $10,000 a year or whatever it is. So how do I get in front of those students more often? Um, we also do see a lot of uh, our, our partners in particular will say, um, hey, large bank or financial institution that's nearby, if you send us more students, we'll give them a 10% discount off the top, right? It, you know, we're willing to do that mm -hmm. as kind of a way to pull them and draw them into the program. Uh, but maybe we're going to do even more than that. We're going to look at um, including you as, uh, you know, uh, some of our case studies or things along those lines too, right? So it's, I think there's the the initial kind of um, transactional stuff that happens, but then over time, hopefully they become part of your advisory panel, they become your alumni, and it becomes a lot more of an organic relationship. But I think initially, there is probably you're going to have to do some some couponing, uh, right, you know, uh, some discounting to be able to draw some folks in and, and kind of find some of those opportunities. So Dennis here, I'd like to hear from you on, um, you know, kind of that conflict or friction between, you know, that of industry and education and really that challenge of synchronizing them, which I see in the lively chat aligns with kind of the thinking of our participants as well. So, I, you know, I think that's a very complex discussion because I think about it, you know, the industry operates at a certain clock speed and that clock speed inherently is just faster than the education clock speed, not because the education clock speed would not like to accelerate. As you, as Matt and others have mentioned, they're doing everything they can to partner with the local employers, partner with the local community colleges, technical development, to get them closer to the need and that speed that the industry is moving at. But the reality is, if you think back, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, let's say on technical skills, right, you had a release from Microsoft maybe every three years. So you had time to prepare for it. You had time to get the, you know, the organization ready for it. Now it's just continuous release, right? Amazon changes its software every day. Microsoft is, is releasing, you know, their, their development platforms every day. So the clock just keeps speeding. Plus many of these organizations over the last year or two during the pandemic accelerated the digital transformation efforts, right? They went from having to have, you know, you know on-premise type activities and people in, in their workflow and also that there's a distributed network of doing digital transformation. And I think part of the problem is not only has the industry sped up and these digital transformations have sped up, but I think employers have not looked at what are the skills within your organization that are adjacent or what are the workers or roles within your organization that are adjacent to some of the skills you're looking for. For instance, in the chat, I see a lot about humanities and, and other things. For me, you know, I don't know if you can see my background, but there's tons of guitars in my background. I find that that graduates who have humanities and music degrees mm -hmm. make great data visualization yeah. experts. They just think differently. They, they're, they're wired differently. They look at patterns differently. So I think employers need to do a better job of identifying those skills within their organization that they have an inventory because they figure, hey, if this person is filling this role, that's the only skill they have. Well, the reality is many people fill their, their free time with learning new skills, right? They're constantly on this lifelong learning journey. And there are many people, uh, I'll give you, you know, an example around chat GPT. I can't tell you how many people have gotten into chat GPT and built up that skill without it being anywhere on their resume or their job or their job performance or their job role or their, or their you know, role or responsibility. But people are doing that. So organizations need to do a better job of identifying find what these future forward skills are, and then inventorying within their organization who might have either those skills already on their own that they haven't inventoried or have adjacency skills that can transition over to these newer roles that are being driven by this digital transformation. And that will help sort of, I don't want to say slow down the industry clock, but they can fill those needs in the industry clock. And, you know, there are a lot of institutions that are doing a great job uh, you know, I was fortunate to be a dean at the University of Phoenix, worked very closely with the Maricopa County Community College System. A, a lot of what Elizabeth talked about, right, working with your local employers, what are their needs, getting the curriculum really, you know, aligned with what those industries that are coming in into Phoenix, who are we hiring in, you know, they're bringing in chip manufacturing and aerospace and all that. So let's work with the community colleges and the local institutions to prepare them for those particular roles. 
and also focus on, you know, I don't call them soft skills, I call them power skills, right? You know, one of those things that have a long, a long life, a shelf life, right? Technology skills to me are like yogurt. They're on the shelf, they'll change, and you can learn those and evolve those over time fairly quickly and just pick those up. But critical thinking, decision-making, problem-solving, these are skills that you can learn and improve on over time and will last you forever, no matter what journey you're on. So yes, the industry runs at a faster speed, but employers need to do a better job of identifying what talent they have in their organizations, which ones can actually be reskilled, upskilled, or re redeployed, give them stretch assignments. I think they'll find that they'll be do a better job of, of keeping up with that clock and not just having to depend on what did you come in with through the door. I think that aligns with even Martiza, Martiza Mercado's question, talking yeah. about partnerships and how, when you do engage in the journey on identifying partnerships, how do you solidify those partnerships? So maybe we'll circle back to that, hopefully, and some of these questions at the end and come back to the panel and just, again, planting that seed of thought, because I see a lot of those um, questions. I also see, um, you know, some lively discussion around um, the how, um, not just the where and the what, but the how that's really critical to this process. Um, so I'm going to transition um, briefly to, to David, and then we're going to move into some deeper Q&A for the group as a whole. Yeah, so I think this is a, uh, a theme that we've seen kind of asked a, a couple times here that is the demand for these skills sort of too fast to keep up with, right? And, and I think that's a concern that uh, a lot of us have. If we go to the following slide here, I think a lot of you were predicting uh, a slide like this with some of the top, you know, in-demand skills uh, here. The biggest one from corporations right now, um, strategic thinking, problem solving, digital communication. A lot of these are those power skills, those human-centered skills that we keep talking about. Um, I think classically, a lot of these are learned um, just in the process of going through a bachelor's degree, right? Or education or, um, so it's like, uh, whatever you're studying, you're sort of picking up these things, right? Whether it be classics or humanities yeah. or engineering, you're kind of having to build these skills along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think is interesting and kind of challenging for folks too, is to think about, some of these skills can be validated in smaller sorts of engagements, right? So I think about one that um, is really popular in our organization is we have a number of people that are um, certified as design thinking facilitators, right? So these are folks that um, have learned a methodology and a process to uh, take you through an empathetic user-centered design experience, right? And so I think, yes, um, you know, uh, you you learn parallel skills in in degrees, but I think there are ways that we can validate some of these things in smaller credentials um, and kind of engage with folks later in their career as well. So we go to the following slide here. Um, we did ask, uh, you know, like I said earlier, this dynamic about uh, hard skills, soft skills, uh, we had trade skills in there too, and we had some different definitions for these, but um, the idea here is asking like, what's the half-life of these skills? What's the velocity that these skills uh, kind of age out. And I think you're you're right. A lot of the folks on the phone saying that our human-centered skills, our sort of liberal arts skills, if we want to call them that, are the ones that kind of carry with you throughout your whole life. Um, but uh, maybe your more technical skills, like your coding skills, some of these technology skills, things along those lines, maybe they've got a shorter shelf life, um, you know, and they're, they're going to be gone a little bit quicker. But either way, you have to sort of engage and rehome these skills throughout your career. Right. And I mentioned this earlier, this idea that um, what leadership means to you or what project management means to you maybe in the 20 in your 20s is going to be very different than it is in your 30s and 40s when you're maybe directing a larger team or, uh, you know, maybe your 40s and 50s when you're marshalling uh, the resources of an entire organization. Right. Like, so I think there are um, things here that are universal in some ways, but they can still use these refreshers. Uh, and that's why I think a lot of schools are even experimenting with things like uh, you know, free courses for life, come back and audit our uh, MBA courses later in your career, things along those lines, thinking about certificates that they can kind of sell to folks that are maybe a little bit more mid and late career, really thinking about that 60 year curriculum. Um, I think so often we are focused on uh, short courses, short education for the laddering up opportunity, right? That like community college, kind of like early career, uh, sort of getting you into the market. Uh, but I think there's also a number of students that we find um, are really excited to go back again and again. And so it's thinking about uh, uh, opportunities for them as well. Would you, I, I, we're, we're so much excitement, so much conversation, would love to have you share and continue to share um, some of the final insights so we can move into that Q&A. Sure. You... Yeah, let's move along. Mm -hmm. So um, 
we'll go to the next slide here. So we recapping key insights, um, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the, the challenges that we were seeing um, from the economy here. We, If you go to the next slide, um, we have some suggested actions, right? And so there's a lot more of this in the actual report, but I think the first one is engaging with your lo local employer market, right? And so we talked a little bit about going out with discounts, right? Kind of drawing in with that strategy, but I think also just having these folks on advisory panels, you know, kind of nurturing your alumni, not just as a, uh, you know, donation kind of development strategy, but also thinking about them as long-term, uh, you know, kind of resources for you and thinking about calibrating your curriculum to their needs. I think that's really an important uh, relationship nurturing opportunity that's there. Um, we talked about employee benefits a little bit, uh, you know, how to sort of maximize some of these things, how to create pathways. Um, I think looking at your individual courses that are really successful and thinking about those as separate products, right, or thinking about, you know, kind of breaking these things down into, into smaller credentials uh, for a larger audience to bring folks back, things along those lines um, is a strategy that we're seeing out there. Um, this is probably an obvious one, but but let's get those positive career outcomes like out on our websites, right? And I think I go to a lot of school websites or I, I talk to a lot of professors and they're really excited about what their students are doing, but I don't see it. They're not selling it, right? And I think that's a really important thing, you know, leveraging that asset being your, your alumni base, I think is really important. Um, and then the final one here is probably an obvious one because this is all moving so quickly. Um, expect a fast refresh rate, right? You know, like this isn't studying the classics where the textbook can be fine for like 10, 15 years without an update. Like these things are gonna be on a, a lot shorter shelf rate. So I think um, building that into the expectation is gonna be important. Thinking about, well, maybe 80% remain static, but 20% updates. And how do we, you know, evolve models where we can um, update and meet needs quickly? Uh, is an important one. Well, that segues wonderfully into the series of questions. And we always welcome more questions. Mm -hmm. well, I should say, I, wonder if, I wish we had e equitable answers to questions, but the numerous questions are also very much welcomed and they're in abundance. So I'm actually going to pose this particular question, I think, that addresses the chat and maybe what you've addressed here and some of our final insights. Um, and maybe direct this towards you, Matt, specifically. What are the ways in which faculty might be able to in, embrace the need for skill development and recognition in their in their course and their syllabi? So we're, we've talked about it from an institutional perspective, and there are some more specific questions in the chat in terms of uh, faculty role in this progress. Could you speak to that a bit here? Sure. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a Center for Teaching, Learning, and Assessment on campus. And what's connected to that is our Center for Cultural Responsive Best Practices and our instructional designer. So they kind of work in hand in hand with critical thinking. So one of the up and coming professional development, um, I th I'd say seminars for faculty on this campus will be led by CTLA, Center for Teaching and Learning Assessment. And it's a critical thinking series and it's challenging. They get, they get recognition for attending it. And um, they get rewards for attending it too. There's some financial rewards depending on a grant that we have. But I was always in continuous improvement as a faculty member all the time. And always trying to update my online skill sets and my face-to-face -face skill sets. So it's, it's a lot of work, but I've found over time keeping up with that level of work as a faculty member to improve at that level was a lot of external research and studying other people in the field and embracing what others are doing as they develop out their skill sets. And then also, I've used it before, kind of getting it thematically woven through their syllabi. And then that syllabi, you actually have a test pilot to see how it goes with the audience that you're, you're performing in front of. So um, I recommend you get out there and study other individuals and practitioners in the field and what they're doing and how they're successful. And oftentimes see how you can kind of bring some of those kind of um, opportunities to your class level. And then you know your class and your syllabi and your, your, your textbooks better than anybody. If somebody wrote 11 textbooks, I eventually abandoned the textbook. And I went with OERs, Open Education Resources. And that's where I'd been ever since I had abandoned my own textbooks. And so OERs also enhance your skill set development. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to see some effective models that are out there. And um, yeah, I mean, I always use it all the time, continuous improvement. 
Well, I think that's very much the thread I see in the chat as well from our participants, which is, you know, how that evolution not just happens, but how we're attentive to who, those who we're serving um, or who we're working with, students um, and the institution, and how to really synthesize that in a way that we're maximizing <laughs> the experience, but not, I think, to some of the questions here. Um, creating obstacles or barriers that might not put them on the right path um, and for the future and the future of the workforce. So I think I'd like to open it up to any of our panelists to reflect on some of those earlier questions, um, one of which was around effective critical thinking across the courses, mm -hmm. or more specifically what I'm seeing in terms of the conversation around um, where that innovation might happen in terms of degree pathways. Um, I welcome our panelists to speak about either one of those and maybe some other insights that you have that connected to our themes today um, and maybe even some of the chat conversations that are going on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start out. There was a, a theme that I think we saw throughout where it's like, you know, uh, like the liberal arts degree is dead, long live the liberal arts degree, right? Like that there's, uh, you know, sort of these concerns about, um, you know, the maybe diminished, uh, you know, kind of place of some of these degrees that historically were, were really important and critical. For me, I think there's a real branding problem, right? And it's kind of a tough conversation, but it's like how we talk about some of these degrees, I think needs to evolve, right? And I think we need to help folks understand why they're important. You know, I think there's a little bit more sales, you know, kind of selling of the degree probably needs to happen. Um, I, I'm talking to a lot of institutions that are doing things like, um, for example, thinking about these as like stackable credentials and thinking about packages of classes that are your uh, you know, maybe your measurement and evaluation core meets your, uh, you know, critical thinking and communication core or things along those lines. And you sort of pick from those areas and then like ultimately with the goal of the student being able to articulate better when they do go to the workforce, why they have these skills in place, right? Like we we know inherently that, um, like we said in the chat, the thread here, that getting an English degree helps you articulate your thoughts better. But let's, let's, train the students how to be able to communicate that thought better, right? I think it's something where there's an area of opportunity. So I'm even seeing some of these get repackaged as like interdisciplinary study, you know, kind of other new words for them too, even to kind of think about, uh, you know, repackaging of some of these ideas. Yeah, I think, you know, critical thinking is an interesting one because I think it needs to start early in the child's development, right? Sure. Early in school around not spoon feeding them, but really providing them with opportunities for critical thinking. As you evolve through high school, uh, many schools do a great job of that. As you go through college, many schools teach you a lot about critical thinking, but at the end of the day, it really comes around applying it to the, you know, to the real life situation. So not teaching a course necessarily on critical thinking, but applying critical thinking principles to all the sort of assignments and sort of projects and things that you're doing. So at the academy, we teach a lot of uh, different hard skills, but we mm -hmm. do it in a way that we're teaching them critical thinking, communication, project management, collaborating in teams, working in uh, agile frameworks. And that's all part of embedded into the curriculum, but then we don't call it out specifically as, oh, you're learning critical thinking, but we're evaluating right. your critical thinking skills as you're applying these to these assignments and projects, like you'll see in the real world. And that sort of continues to evolve. But like uh, David, you said, you know, this is a lifelong learning experience, right? How well you do critical thinking when you're 19 is much different than how you do critical thinking when you're 45 or 50, because mm -hmm. you've learned so much, you have much more experience to go on. But, you know, today's problems are not solved by, by you know, trying to solve problems of four or five, 10 years ago with the same thought process. You've got to apply new things, new thinking, new innovations on solving these problems because it's constantly evolving. So you've got to learn it. It's got to be continuous learning, but critical thinking starts early and you have to continue to practice it and apply it in ways that are not just, oh, I took a course on critical thinking, now I'm an expert on critical thinking. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges that we're facing is in the last like 30, 40 years, we culturally, for better or worse, have, have moved the obligation of like workforce training to, to the actual workforce, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's something where you, you know, you classically you'd, you'd go to work for a company and you'd kind of grow up within it and you'd be trained and sort of evolve along the way. But I think now the expectation is that that employee comes with that skill set, right, and doesn't do as much on the job training. And so, when you when you kind of over index on that, something has to give, right. And I think that's where the, the challenge that we're facing right now. And so it's like, how do you give the people those workforce, you know, important skills, right? Like maybe the Amazon Web Services or Python or whatever else, mm -hmm. but 
you know, to your point, but also give them critical thinking exercises along the way. Well, I think this is a great chance to ask Elizabeth and Matt. I mean, there was a question that was posed um, by one of our participants around, you know, whether or not there's a disconnect between maybe um, higher level members of an organization in, in, in education versus those who might be, um, you know, hiring or doing the employment. I think you're kind of in that position to see whether or not that's occurring and, and why that might be occurring. Elizabeth? Well, it, it, the disconnect, I mean, at some point in order to get to a higher level in an organization, um, probably still the traditional route to that is a baccalaureate degree in many professions. Mm -hmm. um, not absolutely the only way, but the traditional way. So our challenge then becomes um, most of the students who present themselves um, to to workforce training. They're looking for a relatively short-term goal to get a job mm -hmm. or a job with better wages. Um, now, about 20% of students who enter our community colleges do have a baccalaureate degree, mm -hmm. and they're looking for that. They're looking for, um, for education then to help them make that baccalaureate degree um, uh, have an economic value in in the workforce and that's challenging too so there's there's plenty of challenges but what we have to figure out is how to create pathways for um populations for whom the baccalaureate as we currently structured it is not feasible i mean 85 percent of the students that we're serving in our workforce credential programs are over the age of 24. Um, it is going to be hard for them to disrupt obligations to family um, and fiduciary responsibilities um, to go to university for four to six years. It's, yeah. it's probably not going to happen. Therefore, um, programs such as we have in place, but certainly not at scale, not at scale, is um, it's essential to to make it possible for an apprentice to earn a baccalaureate degree. That is possible. Combine the journeyman's license with an associate degree, articulate to a university engineering technology or engineering program, you know, have the company provide tuition assistance benefits. Those are the way some of our populations are going um, into baccalaureate degrees and succeeding. It's very important, I think, at the community college level, we're all very well aware of which businesses provide tuition reimbursement yeah. and what the process is for getting it. Mm -hmm. um, we just need, you know, paid paid internships that are substantial and lead to employment and scheduling that is manageable for working adults. Um, the demographics are going to force us to change the way people get a baccalaureate if we're serious about getting more people who um, who who may want to um, to get into that higher level, into that higher level of education and management. Yeah, it sounds like you've you've identified our next uh, uh, series on reenvisioning the baccalaureate based on the conversations in the chat and and some of the statements here. I, I'm sorry, I think somebody else was going to make a comment that aligns with this conversation here as well. We have about one more minute. I'll just say real quick in the report, we, we did ask the skills gaps question to sort of a, a range of folks, and we did it over two different years. And the C-suite and the leaders kind of saw it coming, like two thirds of them, three quarters of them said, yeah, there's definitely a skills gap, but the more frontline folks, it took them a while to get on board. So that is something I think that question on like, is there a stratification? I think like the more kind of leader executive folks are like, yeah, we definitely have a problem here. Whereas like, I think it took some of the frontline folks a, a little bit longer. Yeah. So I think the, you know, the human resource departments and companies have to get rid of these requirements on job postings that they start off with must have a baccalaureate degree, which is nonsense because in most cases, credentials and certificates and other associate degrees, et cetera, have prepared them for the job, yet they, they're not willing to change that requirement. Or they'll say, I want a college graduate with five years experience. Well, if you're a college graduate, you may not have five years experience, right? So 
Right. I'd rather have somebody who has five years experience and maybe doesn't have a degree who can actually do that. So the employers and their HR departments have to have a transformation and a change in mindset to make opportunities more available to people without the traditional degree. I hate to end the conversation here, but I know that I'm getting the alerts uh, and it's great that we have such a robust conversation. It's clearly an indication of a need for more of these opportunities. And I wanted to thank all the panelists for their expertise and experience and sharing here as well as the, pa the participants willingness to ask questions and to share their insights as well. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you everyone for being part of this conversation. Thank you for the active chat discussion. It was really fun to follow along. So we'll just quickly move through the next couple of slides. I do wanna say, if you're new to WCET, please check our website out. We have a lot of events and programs coming up. We have a, a webcast um, coming up very, very shortly on finding and providing clarity amidst the array of digital learning definitions and modalities, which I'm sure you'll all have stuff to contribute. And we have a member, uh, member only summit coming up on March 9th. And if you're not a WCET member, if you get your application in by the end of the month, which is right around the corner, then you receive two complimentary registrations. And this is a great program. Phil Hill is gonna kick us off, so you won't wanna miss it. It will be recorded and all registrants will, see that, will receive access to the recordings. I'd like to quickly acknowledge our sponsors and our WCET supporting members because they make much of this work that we do here at WCET possible. And I wanted to quickly call out our blog, which is not on one of the slides, but we just released some clarification around our understanding of the guidelines released from the Department of Ed regarding working with OPMs and any contracted server service that you may be working with. So definitely check out our blog, which is WCET Frontiers blog. So we hope to see you on an, another event here soon. Take care, everybody. And thank you so much to our panelists and our partner, Wiley. Take care. Bye.